Well, good morning, Watermark. How are we doing? It is great to be together with our friends in uh, Plano and Frisco and Fort Worth. And we're going to do something this morning we have not done in, in some time. Um, and we are going to give a mission report. Now, hang tight with me because you might go, gosh, I, you know, I mean, uh, I want to know where Watermark is supporting missionaries around the world and what we're doing. And there are folks all over the world that are doing different things. But we're going to give a mission report. I want to welcome our friends that are not normally a part of Watermark and um, let you know that this is a gathering of God's people. We, we invite anybody to come uh, to our gatherings uh, where you can hear us remind ourselves of the kindness of our God and the greatness of who he is, and then also to spur each other on to remember how we should respond to him. Um, we end all of our services with a little phrase, um, have a great week of worship, because we don't believe what we do in this you know, time together on Sunday mornings or the weekends is what defines worship. It's what reminds us why we worship. And we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we even kind of call this uh, weekly a pastor's conference because we're a kingdom of priests and uh, individuals that together are trying to respond to the kindness of our God. Not earn it. This is not a group of people that you're in the presence of that are a bunch of performance-based acceptance people. We are an acceptance-based people who seek to respond to the love that God has shown us the best we can with our lives. And we live on mission together. And so um, Watermark is made up, and the membership of Watermark, there's lots of folks who are here all the time who aren't members of our body. Sometimes people say, I go to Watermark. And those are folks that we're glad they're here. But members are not people that have even been to what we kind of call Discover Watermark, because you don't want to marry yourself to somebody, yoke with somebody, you're not sure it's on the same mission as you, and we have this opportunity for folks to uh, meet with us and discover and be reminded what it is that we're ultimately about, Um, and then we kind of go through, this is what we believe, and this is what we're going to do together. After that, there are some folks that then say, okay, God doesn't want me to do this alone. When God talks about his family, he uses um, a number of metaphors. The first one is that we're a family. And there is a specific family of which you're called to be a part. There is the human family that I'm a part of in Dallas, but there's the Wagner family that I am uniquely a part of, and we have a different relationship with one another. And God says the same thing with believers. They're a part of the universal family, but there should be a local family, if you're serious about your faith, that you say, this is where I'm known, this is where I'm going to be admonished and encouraged and helped. It's where I'm going to be uniquely cared for, and when this family can't meet its needs, I'm going to expand it to other larger parts of the family. And so family, uh, it's also called a body, right? And so we all know that we're members of one another. You don't want to be an arm that's detached from the rest of the body. That's a grotesque thing. It's called being dismembered. And it's a very sad, tragic, um, you're going to bleed out and not be a healthy arm at all if you're detached from the body. So all of us are part of the body, each of us in our unique way, called a flock, which is a little bit indicative of who we are. We're created by God to travel together and to have a shepherd, every single one of us. I need to be shepherded. And you're going to hear that we are ultimately also a group of people that are ambassadors, which means we're part of an embassy. We'll focus a lot on that this morning, but we're going to give a mission report and tell you a little bit about what the people who are members of Watermark, who have identified that this is the place that I'm going to be a part of a family, where I'm going to be shepherd as a part of the flock. This is the body I'm attached to. Okay? Um, If you're a member of Watermark, in fact, kind of just raise your hand up over your head, if you know. Right? Look look around. See how those are folks that are a member. Look around you. Look left and right as you do that. That's great. And and, um, so what I want to do is just remind all of us, um, as we talk about what Watermark does here, Watermark is not this building. We're in four different buildings, in fact, this morning, and a number of our uh, family that can't be here on a regular basis is tuning in online, but we're about to give a mission report. And so here's what I'd like to do. All the members, all the kingdom of priests that are part of Watermark, I would like each of you to turn to one another, those three or four that are around you, and give your mission report. What have you done this week to share your faith? Where, what meaningful relationship have you had with somebody far from God? Now listen, you might be sitting next to somebody who is not a missionary, right? A minister of reconciliation. So you get a chance to go, man, I'm so glad you're here. Let me tell you why we gather, what it is that we believe, 
all right? And then maybe you're sitting next to a bunch of folks that all have stories. You start to say, hey, this is the person that I told about Jesus this week. This is the, the people I just built a relationship with um, and, and um, I, you know, was doing some um, service to that I want to pray for, that more of who Jesus is would be known to them through my life as I care for them. So you ready for the mission report? It's not a slide. <laughs> it's you. If you're here as a guest, in a sense, a mission field, we're so glad you're here, all right? I hope you bump into one of our missionaries and they can love you right now. So we're not just chatting, we're giving a mission report. This is how the gospel was advanced through me this week. Ready? Go. Okay, all right. Hey, that was good. All right, now listen. How many times do we think about the fact that, yeah, what's the church doing mission-wise? So in a second, I'm going to talk about how the church has grown in doctrine and theological soundness, and I want you maybe to turn to each other and just go, this is what I've read this week to grow in my understanding of the true nature of God, a fundamental understanding of, um, uh, of the authority of God's word. In effect, what I would do, and I'm not going to do this, but have you turn to one another and say, hey, I got to remind myself, I am the church. Church isn't this organization I go to and evaluate. If I'm a member there, it means the way I grow, the way I love, the way I serve, the way I live is the way the church grows, loves, lives, and serves. In America, way too often, the church is a thing we kind of buy into and go, yeah, that's the church I go to. And it's not possible to go to church. You either are the church or aren't the church. I've said a lot lately. It's kind of like, can you imagine meeting somebody uh, and you go, hey, what are you doing tonight? They go, ah, I'm going to go to gang. <laughs> what do you mean you're going to go to gang? Like, I'm going to go to gang. I'm going to evaluate the gang and how they terrorize the community, traffic women, and sell drugs. I mean, you don't go to gang. You either gang bang or they beat you, Right? You just go hang with the gang. You do gang work, right? Now, what our gang does is loves, serves, grows, confesses, and forsakes, and yields, and encourages. That's what this body does. Now, I want to tell you something we're going to do in two weeks, and then I'm going to teach as to why so you don't groan too much, and I don't think you will. I don't know if you guys know it or not, but I mean, I know you know there was a storm that blew through here um, just a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was pretty devastating, about $2 billion worth of damage. One of the things it did is it damaged um, some friends of ours at Northway. Northway used to be a uh, campus of the Village Church, which we've, for a long time, you know, along with others, said, hey man, same team. We're all about the same. We're, 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 we're Wagners, we're Watermarkers, we're Village, we're, we're whatever we might be, but we're part of a larger family of, the God, of God. And this particular family um, had their facility uh, destroyed. And so um, right away we reached out to them and just said, hey, listen, we know you guys need a place to gather. And so we said, come on over. And um, until we can figure out where you're gonna be and what you're gonna do, we have a facility that specifically Sunday afternoon we're not using. And so come on. And so Northway church, uh, for the first time in the history of their church, all got together together. They do three services. Their, their facility holds about 1,000 people. And so last Sunday at 4 o'clock, they gathered in here um, to meet, to worship, to equip each other, to remind themselves of what is true. We have had a great time feeding them afterwards. They're going to continue to meet here um, until they can find a, a more permanent place, maybe that's closer to where they were, or that um, their, their building is restored. They'll be here today at 4 o'clock. Uh, I texted Shay this morning and just said, Shay, I'm praying for all the gatherings of God's people that will happen at 7540 LBJ today. And so, you know, Northway's here. They, they've lost their building, but Northway wasn't lost. And one of the things that's heavy on my heart and the elder's heart here at Watermark is we know there's going to be a day, potentially, when this building is either going to be destroyed by time or taken by government. And we will not be able to gather this way and speak freely this way. And our goal is that there would be thousands of communities of faithful people all over this city that will continue to minister together, gather together, and be embassies of God's work. And we're equipping each other for that. Here's the question. Do people in your neighborhood know who God's put in their neighborhood? Well, in two weeks, we're going to give you a chance. In two weeks, 7540 LBJ will only meet at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when Northway's here. But that Sunday... 
what we're going to ask you to do is um, over the next two weeks, be very intentional with folks who live in your apartment complex or who live in your neighborhood. Uh, and, and just uh, be knocking on doors, build a relationship uh, that maybe you don't have or, or furthering one that you do have, and just saying, hey, on November 17th, we're going to gather together uh, down here at my house for just a brunch and coffee. We're going to hang out. I'd love you to come. And, uh, and, and some of them said, no, I, I, Sunday? I, I'm actually a part of a community that gathers on Sunday, and you say, fantastic, go there. I am too, um, but we're, this particular Sunday, we're meeting on our neighborhood, and we're gonna tell people why we're not usually here on Sunday. And all of our friends that are here every single week, we're gonna tell them, hey, I want you to know um, that I am a part of a community of faith. I happen to be a follower of Jesus. And... Um, God's placed me here in this community to be a means of grace to you. And so I want you to know anything I can serve you. If you've never met a Christian before, ever don't know anybody, you can ask a question about things of the faith. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm your guy, okay? I'm, we're your family. And, and we'd love to serve you. Um, our body is specifically wants to ask, do you have needs right now that aren't being met, that you wonder if God is there and he cared for me, that he might show up in a specific way? And then we're gonna encourage you with you and your, your, your network of community that you would do everything you can to meet those needs. And if you can't, um, we'll widen the circle and figure out how we should appropriately love people throughout our city where we're stationed in different outposts, where every embassy is located, where God's ambassadors are placed. We think... People should know that this is an embassy of God's work in the city. And so you're going to have a chance just to say to your neighbors, hey, listen, this is why I'm not usually here on Sunday. And I want you to know I'm here all the time. If, I, if you ever want to know a friend that you can go to church with, I'm your guy. If you have a question about the faith, I'm your guy. I may not know the answer to your question, but guess what? We've got this thing every Monday called Great Questions where I'll go with you and it, 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 no one's trying to convince you of anything. They just want to share with you good answers to your really good questions. Either I'll have them for you now or we'll get them. And this city needs to know where, where 15, 20,000 of us are so that they can be encouraged. Because this building is not the church. We are the church. Now, we've got another couple on our block that's members here at Watermark. We're gonna do it with them. We'll invite our friends and say, hey, come to one of our houses and we'll be there together. And I wanna give you some resources. This is what we do all the time, right? So a, a real truth, real quick, specifically, there'll be a number of them listed in this week's sermon notes. Every single week, we put out sermon notes that summarize the big ideas and the scripture we used and, and some application questions and other resources to deepen in your understanding. And some of the real truth real quicks that we'll put there with links are what is the gospel? You can just remind yourself of that as you get ready uh, to meet with some friends. Um, you, your friends might even ask you this question. Um, what happens to people who have never heard the gospel? And I'm gonna come back to that one in just a second. There's a real truth real quick just to refresh your mind on that. But may it never be said that people lived on the same street as us, lived in the same apartment complex as us, never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. How do I talk to my friends about Jesus? There's a real truth real quick on that one. How do I have a conversation with people who don't agree with my faith? What makes a good testimony? All these links will be there for you to use. There'll be another link to just how to share the message of the Bible in, in you know, 30 or 60 seconds that um, you can listen to, maybe even play that morning. But look, it's your goal that morning is not to convert anybody. I don't ever try and convert people when I talk. It's not my job to convert people, and it's not your job to convert people. Our job is to love people, and our job is to share with people the love that we have found from Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit's job to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. But God has said, hey friends, it's your job to share with people what sin is, what true righteousness is, and what judgment looks like. Now we're in the Proverbs series. Let me read you some Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 11 and 12. Deliver those who are being taken away to death. And those who are staggering to slaughter Oh, hold them back. 
If you say, I said, we didn't know this. I didn't know that. I mean, it's America. All my friends know who Jesus is. Uh Uh-uh. If you say, see, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And will he not render to everyone according to his work? You see, there's going to be a mission report that's going to be given. And every single one of us are going to have an opportunity to give an account for what we have done with the ministry of reconciliation that God has given all of us who have come to believe. Some people would say, man, Todd, I I don't know, man. Um, You know, we're being told right now, in fact, as a community that, hey, uh, why would you guys want to go and love people in this community? Have they invited you to come? And I would just say, hey, we as believers don't go where we're invited. We do the inviting. Our job is to invite other people. Well, hey, um, well, are are they going to like it if you come? You know, some people might say, is... um, They're not going to love it if you come down there and you haven't been invited. And I would just say, we don't expect to be loved. We love. And the more we're unwelcome and hated, the more we're compelled by the example of our king to love our enemies. And when we're reviled, to not revile in return. And when we suffer, to not utter threats. That's what we do. And so, um, you know, when you came in, and we gave you a couple things. It's just a little card that kind of uh, summarizes all the different areas for folks to connect here that can be a service to them. And uh, when we gather and things like that, we've got this thing called a top 10 card that I want to just point you to right here. And this top 10 card is just something you got when you went through our membership process that every single one of us always have 10 friends that hopefully we have a personal relationship with. I would define a personal relationship in these day and ages, I've got their cell number. They've got mine. I can call them and they'll know who I am and I can invite them to watch a game, grab a meal or do something and they would, they would be predisposed to do that. That's what a friendship is. In fact, here's what we say. If you look in the back where we just talk about our seven-step strategy to be faithful ambassadors is number one, we initiate a friendship with someone far from God. We initiate a friendship with everybody, but specifically we're just saying part of our job to do what Jesus did, which is to seek and save the lost, is that we seek friendships with people who don't yet have what we have, which is a knowledge of the kindness and goodness of God, an understanding of the gospel, which is not that you better go to church and do good things or God's gonna smack you, because that's not the gospel at all. The gospel is God sees us in our state of rebellion and an animosity with him, and he loves us. He doesn't wait for us to seek him. He seeks us. And so we do what he does, right? Luke 19, 10. This is our master that we're supposed to be conformed into his image. And it says, Jesus, the son of man, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so we believe that we should also in part do the same with our lives. He's the one we sing about, right? You leave the 99 to find the one. Well, guess what? We're gonna forsake one Sunday morning of gathering together so we can have friends who don't know where we split off to, why we're in their neighborhood as a means of grace. We initiate a friendship. We share our story of grace at some point. We just let them know what we know and uh, about the kindness of God and how our lives have changed. Then we invite them to come and see. After that, God's got to go to work. After that, we just pray that they would eventually one day come, that they would be introduced ultimately to biblical community, that they would then be trained themselves um, in the way that we're being trained, and that they would then uh, devote themselves to Christ, and that they would then use their gifts the way we're using our gifts for his glory, and they would start to invite somebody who's far from God and join us in the mission. That's what we do, but mark my words, every single one of us are going to give an account. This is the way the entire Bible ends. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 says, behold, I am coming quickly. You don't have a lot of time. These are the days. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me and I will recompense every single individual according to what he has done. There is judgment even for believers. Salvation is always a gift, always a gift. But you're either gonna be judged to not have been a person who wanted the gift, or you're going to be judged how you did once you received the gift. 
What kind of servant were you? Are you a son? Are you a daughter of God? You become a son or daughter of God by acknowledging that there's no way you can have a relationship with a holy, perfect father except that he makes provision for you. And so when you, in that case, believe in him and pass out of judgment into life, you then move over into this servant where God's gonna say, how'd you do? And there will be reward and there will be sadness, a sense of loss where we frivolously lived our life, not in any way engaged in the things that God left us here to be engaged in. Our job as friends is to spur each other on that that wouldn't be our story. So we have a ton of life and fun together, but we remind each other that no soldier, 2 Timothy 3 says, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life in order that he might please the one who has enlisted him as a soldier. So guys, we have two weeks to invite. This is not a week to take off. This is a week for you to let the world know, hey, I, I live here as a part of God's grace to you. And I want you to know I love you. Now let me just encourage you with a few things. Um, first of all, God's gonna use you. We've always done this here at Watermark. In fact, in 2004, 2005, I, I gave a message similar to this one. And um, I, I've saved this for a long time right here. And it was a note I got. It wasn't signed in January of 2005 from a member. It said, hey, Todd, several months ago, you mentioned um, how it hurt you to see all the opportunities that we had here. There were some empty seats in Lake Highlands High School at the time. Um, and how it hurt you that there were people missing out on the greatest news in history because we weren't doing what we could to invite others. Well, I was convicted as you said that. And since that time, I've continually been inviting friends that I've known all along to come and hear what I hear, to come and know what I know. It was amazing just a couple of weeks ago to see one of the guys that I invited all of a sudden inviting others. He brought his sister, he brought his cousin. Thank you, he said, for reminding me of how many people will come to gather and learn if they're just asked. Thanks for reminding me to expect God to use me in great ways. I think you're gonna experience that. I really do. We've always said at Watermark that the most important people here, and this comes out of Luke 19, 10, the most important people at Watermark are the next 100 people that come. And I never say that without saying this. It's because those next 100 are so important that we so deeply pour into you to shepherd you, encourage you, disciple you, because you're the means that God's going to reach them with. I'm gonna pull something back from 10 years ago I used because it's just so great. It's my friend Penn, of Penn and Teller. And um, he's sharing a story. Penn's a rather famous atheist. He's a rationalist. And uh, you're gonna see he doesn't even know this very intellectual person you're gonna find has not spent much time with the Bible. He doesn't, for instance, even know if Psalms is in the Old or the New Testament, which is, I don't blame him, but I do challenge sometimes people who say, I, I don't believe in God, I reject God, and they've never read the most influential book in history, which is the Bible. It's been printed, read, translated more than any other book. It's influenced more literature, it's influenced more civilizations, and more people than any other book in history. And to reject the message of the scripture without ever understanding it is not exactly an intellectual move. And that's why one of the things I say to people a lot of times is simply this. Has anybody ever explained to you what the message of the Bible is? And most folks go, well, I don't believe the Bible is God's word. And I usually say to them, I'm not asking you if to believe the Bible is God's word. I'm asking you if you know what the central message of the Bible is. And then I say, it is the most printed, translated, influential book in literature and political civilization in history. And it would be rather unintellectual, and I see you care about intellectual things, if you reject this message without even knowing what it says. I'm asking you, do you know the central message of the Bible? And most folks are gonna say, well, you know, do good or you're gonna get in trouble. Or do unto others you would have them do unto you. And you can just parlay that if they get that right. That's not the central message of the Bible, but you can say, it's close, let me explain to you. And you can watch that Bible in 30 seconds what the central message of the Bible is. This is Penn, after one of his shows. He was doing a little video podcast. This is kind of a rough looking pen. Apparently he does it very early in the morning. And, um, and he's sharing an interaction he had with a guy that was at his show that he'd actually pulled up and was on stage with him a little bit. So uh, the guy was complimenting him on the show. And I want you to listen to what he says. 
because I think he represents your friends. Listen. You hear what he said again and again and again? He looked me in the eye. He was polite and kind. And he just loved me. You know, so many times I hear people say to me, hey, Todd, I, I just want to know God's will for my life. I did a real truth real quick a couple of weeks ago. How do I know God's will for my life? And one of the things I say in there is you shouldn't spend so much of your time trying to seek God's will for your life as you should just get busy doing God's will. And God has told us what his will is. In fact, at the very end of all four gospels, at the beginning of the work of the church, all four gospels end the exact same way. This is Matthew, watch. This is the end of the book of Matthew. Go, go and make disciples. By the way, disciples doesn't mean converts. Your job is not to make converts, but God's just saying, teach people. The word disciple means learner. Your job is to go and let them see your good works, that they might want to glorify your Father in heaven a little bit more, that you could explain to them what the central message of the scripture is. Most people think it's do good long enough and you won't get judged. It's not the central message. The central message of the scripture is that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That God made him who was rich for our sakes to become poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. The central message of the Bible is the wages of us leaving God is death, but, but the free gift of God anchored in history is the opportunity to be reconciled to God and eternal life through Christ Jesus. Go and make disciples. Go and share that. Let them learn more of the goodness of God's way and the truth of God's story. And when they're ready to believe in it, then you baptize them. But the Spirit will take care of whether or not they're going to act on it. Your job is just to be God's loving voice. Go and make disciples. Mark chapter 16, very end of that book, okay? He said, go. In case you wonder what all this is about, go into all the world and preach the gospel. The very end of Luke chapter 24, last chapter, Jesus sat with his disciples and beginning with Moses and then all the prophets, he said, this is the central point of the Bible. It was pointing to me. Everything that's gonna happen now, some of you guys and a few guys that don't know me yet are gonna write some more about what I've done and what people should do with what I've done. And he explained, it says, in Luke 24, 27 to them, all things um, pertaining to the scriptures. And then a little bit later in 45, when Jesus was sitting with those friends, he sits down there with them and he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that Christ would suffer, this is what I just did, and rise from the dead, that's what I am now before you, and that there would be repentance that people could go through and they would receive the forgiveness of sins and that his name would be proclaimed to all the nations. Beginning right here in Jerusalem, you men are witnesses of these things. And so at the very end of the book of John, he says this in John. He says, um, even as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then, in the book of Acts, as the church starts, he says, but you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you believe in the truth of who God is and your relationship with God, with the indwelling spirit of truth that you now embrace and know and have an intimate relationship with, you then will be my witnesses, starting in your little neighborhood, expanding all around the Metroplex, and eventually, to the uttermost parts of the world. It's pretty clear to me what God's will is for us. Do you know this? There was a person who studied, and I don't like what they did. They decided to determine that it was a healthy church, that a church was healthy, okay? If one out of 20 members, if one out of 20 members actively shared their faith in Christ with others that resulted in tangible transformation in another life, if one out of 20 members did that once a year and it resulted in life change, they go, that's a healthy church. And when they studied churches in America, they said less than 3% of the churches in America are healthy by that definition. Now that's a problem. And so one of the things that we have tried to do since we started is just go, hey, look, man, we're just, we're just one part of the family. And so we want to be faithful so that 
others will see what we're doing and it will spur them on. That happens, I want you to know. Because of the way you faithfully live, because you're ready to give a mission report, I know there are other communities that are just kind of going, man, I, we gotta get with it. Why am I not as excited about Jesus as my friends that are part of that family over there are? And you can spur them on in amazing ways. Do you know that our younger millennial generation, when they, when they question them, this is practicing, and I put it in quotes, this is according to a recent study called Reviving Evangelism by George Barna, who is kind of the George Gallup of looking into church world stuff. Of young millennials who are practicing Christians, you're gonna see they're not practicing Christians, because 50% of them believe it's wrong to evangelize. Now why is that? It's because they have been socially conditioned and programmed that you don't tell other people what you believe. They're victims of a postmodern world more than they're victims of God communicating to them absolute truth. And when you share with people, you do it kindly, you do it politely, you look them in the eyes, you do it out of relationship, you're not trying to convert them, you're just trying to say, this is what I've come to know. This is the truth that's changed my life. It says that only 23% of non-believers in America, listen to this, are part of a spiritual community or have a relationship with a community of believers where they feel like, yeah, I think if I really wanted to explore questions about this thing called Christianity, only one in four non-believers even knows where one of those embassies are and has a relationship with them. It's amazing stats. Um, while, while 75% of Practicing believers believe the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus? 25% say it's probably wrong to interrupt people's lives and share with them our faith. Now listen, I don't know who those folks are, I just wanna love them, and if it's us, I wanna repent. Do you know why? Because I know if you say, see, we didn't know this, Todd. I know that the one who weighs the hearts and the one who keeps your soul is gonna to render to you according to your work. And I wanna remind you who you are and what God wants you to be about. I, I, I keep this, this is, what's, this is from a track. You know a little track that you might hand out? This is come from a track called um, you know, An Atheist Testimony. This is, this is really kinda, of, I think, something that Penn would have written. This is, this is the atheist testimony. Did I firmly believe, the atheist says, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and practice of religion in this life influences destiny in another, relig in, in another life, then religion would mean to me everything. I don't like the term religion. I'm using it because the atheist is. All right? But they're just saying, the atheist says, I would cast away earthly enjoyments, earthly cares, earthly thoughts as worthless. Religion would be my first waking thought and my last image before sleep sank me into unconsciousness. I would look at one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. Earthly consequences should never keep my hand from being active in the cause of the gospel, nor seal my lips. I would strive to look upon eternity alone and on the immortal souls around me, soon to be everlastingly happy or everlastingly miserable. I would go out to the world and preach, and my text would be, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? All the guy's saying is, look guys, if this book's true, I don't, you don't love me if you don't kindly in the context of relationship, look me in the eye and go, hey man, here's just something I've come to know. That's what friends do. So in two weeks, we felt like the right thing to do was just for us to gather in smaller embassies. So in that day when this larger gathering space is no longer ours, people are put on notice of who the church is. It's not an LBJ, it's right where you live. text I want to spend the most time in this morning can be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 10 and following. And, and I, I, just, I just want to say this. I want to set this up because I, I was talking to a buddy of mine um, who actually uh, had a tragedy in his family. And, and, and really, 2 Corinthians 5 this week, as he lost a daughter, has been a lot to him. It talks about what's going to happen in verses 1 through 9. And, and you know, he just said, man, Todd, that idea that to be absent from the body is to be present in Christ has comforted me a lot. 
And as he said it, I go, man, that would bring a tremendous amount of comfort to me as well if I lost one of my daughters, is knowing that she was in the presence of the Lord if she had a faith. But, but what I also thought as I heard that, really verses one through nine really say this, to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. But verses 10 through 21 can be summarized this way, to be present in the body is to be at work for the Lord. To be present right now in this body, the reason we're here, it's not a mystery. We know why we're here. Because there are people like Penn, like our neighbors, like family members, The 2 Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine says this, these who don't know the kindness of God, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the glory of God and and the presence of the Lord. See, right now, non-believers have some of the glory of God around them. God is here restraining evil. This world is not as God intended it, but it's not all the evil it could be. God is restraining evil. His grace is here on the earth. The rain falls on the land of the righteous and the unjust to produce crops. There is food. When a lost person's arm is slit, their body clots, their blood clots like everybody else's. There are Christians that are on earth that are um, ministering and doing kind things. The spirit of God is restraining evil. Watch the real truth real quick on why does God allow mass shootings? There's a lot of things that God stops. There's some evil he lets out to remind us, this is not the world that I wanted because this world doesn't follow me. But there's going to be a day when there's nothing that will remind people about the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. It's a sobering idea. So so watch this. And, And I want to say this one little word right here because some people go, well, Todd, man, that's awful. What about those that have never heard? I mean, what about those? I told you there's a real truth real quick, but let me just give you a little phrase you're going to hear in there. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, who served people in the same way that I am as a communicator of God's truth, he was asked one time this question, hey, will the heathen or will the unevangelized who have not heard the gospel be saved? And I loved his response, and it's what has motivated us as elders and leaders to say, we're going to do this in two weeks. Spurgeon responded by that question. He said, you know what? It's more a question to me whether we who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who don't, whether we can consider ourselves really saved. Do you get that? It's not so much, hey, what about those who have never heard? And by the way, there's a really good answer about what God's going to do with those who have never heard. But here's a question. Can you say you know God and that the spirit of grace and truth dwells in you and you're indifferent to people? Because I think that's a little bit of what's going on in in Proverbs chapter 24 and in Revelation 22, which is I'm gonna render to you according to who you really were. Because people say what they think, but they do what they believe. And the fact that you're not doing what people who believe do. And so this is not, this is just us having a moment of clarity. Oh yeah, that's why we're here. Paul apparently read Proverbs. Look at the way 2 Corinthians 5.10 starts. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. If you want to know what the fear of the Lord is, this week's real truth real quick. It's out there. Go get it. We persuade men. But we are made manifest to God. We do all we can to to share with folks what we know, and we're made known before God, and I hope that we're also made known to you, that you look at us and watch our lives, and you go, hey, that person, that person's marked by love. That person's marked by mission. That person's marked by purpose. That person's marked by sanity. It's gonna show up literally. Remember what, what, what Penn said? He was just saying, Paul is about to say, if I'm crazy, if I look like, um, I, I, I see something that most people in the world can't see. It's for the glory of God. That's who we are. We're people that have come to see this story of grace that's anchored in history. We have a faith, right? By the way, Penn has a faith. His faith is in suppressing evidence. His faith is in Darwinism. His faith is in this idea that there was no design and no creator. When you talk to somebody like that, an atheist, 
You know, when you, they hear you say the word faith, they're gonna go, see, that's the deal. I, I live in reality, you live in faith. And I would just, I always tell them this. Hey, the opposite of faith is not reason. The opposite of faith is unbelief. The opposite of reason is irrationality. Let's take a look at what I believe and take a look at what you believe and examine the evidence and see who takes more faith to believe it. Paul says, listen, we're not commending ourselves to you, and Paul's not saying I'm better than anybody else, but I'm giving you in my gospel focus an occasion to be proud of us so that you can have an answer to those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. Watch, Paul says if I'm crazy, if I'm zealous for the gospel, if I tell it and share it in a kind, purposeful, unrelenting way, it's for God. But if we live sanely, if our houses are different, it's for you. So let me just, just take this idea just a second right here. You know, we had um, this um, moment this week called Halloween, which I love Halloween, all right? Because it's the night when we all go out on the stage and dress up like, you know, the angel of death or some ghoulish thing or any of that nonsense. But there's a night that people, when they knock on their door, folks gladly answer it. It's not like, there's a knock at the door, hide, don't answer it, right? Maybe they'll go away. But people go out and they welcome folks, it's awesome. And so, um, you know, Halloween uh, this week, let me just show you a picture. Uh, Halloween, uh, and it has nothing to do with my message, but man, isn't that cute? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to go, Ramsey. All right, but, but here's another picture I'm about to show you in a second. And what I did is I went and got, because right now all my kids are grown, and uh, my grandkids, other than Ramsey, who was up in Frisco, aren't old enough to actually go to houses. And so I went to another couple of friends, you know, the Leventhal's and the Fournettes, whose kids were trick-or-treating together, and I said, I gotta take you somewhere. You gotta come with me. Because there was a house that we discovered about literally 15 years ago. We call it the Motherload House. <laughs> it's the Motherload House because when you go to this house, they don't give you a little Snickers, all right? Uh, they give you a pound bag of M&Ms, or Skittles, and not just a pound bag, but they give you like a saber, a lightsaber, or a little spinning wheel that lights up in all these different colors, and we'd always, at the end of the night, we'd go to this house, and it's just tucked in a little neighborhood, like any other little sweet little house, but it is the mother load house. <laughs> and so I loaded up their gaggle of 13 children between the two of them, and drove slowly, and um, <laughs> got to this house. Here they are coming out of the mother load house. You can see them holding it up, right? That little white thing spinning is multicolored. You just, the camera couldn't catch it. But, but it was amazing. And like their parents said, that was the highlight of the night, Todd. And I go, of course it's the highlight of the night. Because they went to the mother load house. And what I want to tell you is, hey guys, everybody on your block ought to go, that's the mother load house right down there. And I'm not talking about on Halloween. I'm just saying there's more grace and more mercy and more love and more kindness that comes out of that house on this neighborhood than any other house in our block. That is an embassy of heaven there. That's the mother load. And every time somebody goes with it, it's a highlight of our neighborhood that you're in it and that you're here in our apartment complex. For the glory of God. They might think you're crazy the way you reconcile conflict. They might think you're crazy and when some dog you know, does something in your yard, you don't come out yelling at him, you just walk out there and say, hey man, how you doing? You pick it up, tie it up, and I can do for you? It's awesome, so glad we're neighbors, right? <laughs> they go, that's crazy. How about this, there was another story I literally found yesterday that was so insane and saying all at the same time that NBC News, it was an eight-year-old who did something, that NBC News goes, hey, we gotta talk about this. Watch this. He says, there you go, it's all good now. And he walks away. And NBC News goes, who does that, right? I, I can even think about if I was there, that was caught in a Nest camera, if I was there and it was my kid, oh, no, baby, baby, that's okay, you don't need to do that right here. You know, because I'm, I'm gonna rate her candy anyway, so I don't wanna lose any. <laughs> Right? But I heard the mom go, oh, Jackson. And I heard the world go, our world needs more of that. Can I just tell you something? You got more grace in your bag than you could ever eat. And there's lots of houses that don't have any of it in their house and you're just gonna take it out and you're gonna put it in. And when you do that and you put in love in houses that don't have it and grace and mercy, you're never lacking. And the world's gonna start to go, man, look at that. Not a bunch of cloistered, selfish Christians gathering up with their little sweet story. NBC News. 
can't resist love and sacrificial living. Look what it says. We're gonna just go quickly through this. Watch. Paul says, it's the love of Christ that controls me. Is that what controls you or your love of ease? Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. We're no longer about ourselves. He died for all so that those like me who who might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And so Paul says in verse 16, therefore we don't recognize anybody by the flesh. What they can do for us, how they treat us, no, he says. We've known Christ according to the flesh, though we don't know him any longer. We know he's the resurrected king, that's who he was. Therefore, if anyone knows Jesus, everything's changed. The old things have passed away. Something new has come. There's now an embassy where you are. Watch. These truths that I share with you, he said all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's what God was doing through Christ. Watch this. Not counting their trespasses against them and he has committed to us, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God himself, every day between now and November 17th, and on November 17th, God was making an appeal through us where he's begging others on behalf of Jesus that they'd be reconciled to God. That's why we're here. It's what we do. And we're gonna get judged according to our works. It's what a privilege. We get to give a mission report every day. I'm just out there. Just This is the mother load of Grace House. This is the Mercy House. And let me just stick this in here, right here. Okay, that weekend, we're still going to gather together corporately. We're going to gather in this room on November 16th at 7 p.m. that night. Because some of you guys are going to need prayer because I know you're going to be scared to death. But not really. I know you're ready. I know so many of y'all are doing this right now, all the time. But we're gonna gather just to remind ourselves why we do this. And listen, when we gather on Sundays the way we do, our worship time of 20 to 30 minutes, you don't get to really experience corporate singing worship in all the ways that I think God wants us to sometime. And so this is going to be not just um, three times as much of what we do on Sunday morning. There's gonna be... um, there's gonna be a movement to this evening. There's gonna be times of silence. There's gonna be time of real celebration. We're gonna encourage you to be every way that's biblical free. And um, we're gonna have our, our team set up differently than we usually do. And I, I know you might, and we're gonna invite Fort Worth and Plano and Frisco. We're gonna be at seven o'clock. We're gonna, have, we're gonna pack out out there and we're gonna pack out in here. And it's gonna be amazing. And it's gonna be set up to welcome everybody. But I would tell you, November 16th, we're going to gather. And if you want to know what we really think extended corporate worship should look like, you don't want to miss that night. But if people want to know what God's people look like, we don't want your neighborhood to miss you. And so on November 17th, you're going to gather and you're going to invite your friends over and just say, this is why I'm not usually here on the weekends. And we're not selling anything. I just want to let you know, we'd love to let you know we're here to serve this, this neighborhood. Hey, we're going to make mistakes And when we do, man, don't get mad at us. Would you just call us so we can clear up the mistakes we've made and seek your forgiveness? And if you've ever wanted to know where forgiveness comes from, we'd love to tell you. Here's some things that are coming up. Here's some things that have blessed our family. Here's where we hang out. Come and see. If you have questions, I'll either answer them for you or I'll point you where you can, but I'm just glad to be your neighbor. You ready, church? What a privilege. It's what we get to do. Be the mother load. Be his ambassador. Father, I thank you for the chance to gather this morning and remind ourselves who we are. I thank you for um, what you've taught us, what you've modeled, that, Father, you, you yourself, in the person of your son, you made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And having become the righteousness of God, I pray that now we would go into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, into our city, and we would just love, be kind, polite, and sane. And we'd love and we'd just share the message and and that people would just watch the way that we live and they'd go, that's a little crazy the way you, 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 you believe this. 
for the glory of God, and they would say, but man, the wisdom with which you live, and the wisdom with which you lead your family, and the wisdom with the way you care for our neighborhood, and the wisdom with which you operate your life, we could use more of that. And Father, we would let them see those good works, and it would push them to glorifying you, our Father. So thank you for this family that spurs me on in this way, that is ready to give a mission report, and that's ready to love. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.